Hi, my name is Liam and I'm from Neeran Brothers. Now, I'm at Wired for Wonder where we have four fantastic speakers for you to hear from. A poet, a magician, an inventor and a slightly less scary version of Big Brother. I hope you enjoy. Affecting, effecting, affect, effect, impact. That is what matters about. So, at what stage do we disconnect from emotion? It's an interesting question, given that feeling disconnected is an emotion. Um, I think, for me personally, I'll disconnect from the emotion when I've finished the poem, which is another way of saying, if I was to speak for you, uh, you should disconnect from the emotion once you feel that you've been able to appropriately express it. Mm. And do you think that, I guess that idea then of when to disconnect, uh, how identifying of when to disconnect or when something is finished, how do you identify that? Yeah, okay, that's, that's great. That's, that's where I'm really fascinated. So I will, I speak about once you acknowledge that you can have an effect on me and I can have an effect on you, then it's up to me to choose how I want you to affect me. I guess, can you talk about what is the difference between sympathy, empathy and compassion? Uh, sympathy, empathy, compassion. So um, I think of them as uh, almost like physics, like dynamics. Um, so sympathy to me is complementary, meaning that um, it moves from one level to another. Yeah. So I need to have somebody to be sympathetic of. So it's, there's a direction to it, yeah? Um, empathy, I feel like the experience is more mutual. So we share the experience. I step into your shoes, I live life like you do. I, I attempt to, yeah? Um, and compassion, well, I think, I don't know that it's a completely separate word for me. Um, I think it could it's similar to sympathy, it's similar to empathy at different times, but it always seems to have a negative frame on it. Sympathy, I think, can be a bit condescending. Um, it sort of establishes a hierarchy, um, whereas empathy is an equaliser. And which do you think is the most important? Empathy. People can feel for someone, people can have sympathy for someone, but how do they gain, the, I guess, this next level of empathy? Okay, great. Uh, there's so many ways you can do it, yeah? Um, if I use metaphors, um, then you get a better understanding of how I'm feeling. Um, so if I say that the talk today, I nailed it, or if I say the talk today, I knocked it out of the park, there's a difference between those two metaphors, yeah? So nailed it is a like, almost precise type thing, yeah? and it's the kind of perfectionist type thing. Now that's not me, and that's not what I did. But knock it out of the park is different. It's just letting loose and letting it fly, yeah? And that, that feels right to me, yeah? Now when I say that to you, you're able to kind of tune into the way that I feel, we share the moment. Do you, do you consider yourself an urban philosopher? <laughs> um, I prefer wild sage. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, <but laughs> I was trying to think of the opposite of urban. I guess it's wild and I like the archetype sage. Um, that's an interesting question. Uh, I, I, it's a difficult question to ask me because I don't like names and I don't like titles. Um, mainly because they're a concept. But I never want to get weighed down um, so by a title. So in my talk today I talked about um, Lao Tzu and how he said uh, when you let go of, when I let go of who I am, I become what I might be. And that's really exciting to me because that's, that's moving towards potential. Um, but if I get really attached to a title or something, that's more the, the feeling of pride. Mm. I'll, I'll give you a riddle actually, it's short. Yeah. So with pride, you adore what happened before. But I'll take you places you've never been. When things are going your way, I soar. When things don't, I flee the scene. But the more we stretch out and explore, like Jack and his little bean, the higher I will grow in you, and the more will have done and seen. Mm. What am I? Pride, isn't it? 
Pride was the beginning. I would never do that. That'd be cruel to put the, the word, the answer in the riddle, yeah? Yeah. It's uh, confidence. Oh. But you did jump on the word, yeah? So mm. I said, uh, with pride, you adore what's happened before, yeah? Mm. The interesting thing about that and why it's relevant to what I call myself a title is that pride only exists in the past. In a sense, we're restricted by labels and that they confine us to these regimented ideas. How would you define yourself? So you, well, I would often, if somebody, I always get asked, what's my favorite color, yeah? I'll say my favorite color today. And so how would I define myself today? Uh, today I'm an orator. I did a good job up there. I would like to do it again. So that's what I am today. What I am tomorrow, I'll find out tomorrow. And I can't always do that, but that's the way I would like to go. Does that make sense? Awesome. <laughs> can, can you uh, discuss the intertwined relationship between uh, the future of youth and science? My generation is the first generation to have smartphones. So we didn't, we're very clumsy, we don't know how to use them. Whereas um, the next generation is kind of born into it. They don't have the same, they won't have the same awe of technology. Yeah? It'll, be a, it'll be like a pencil is to me. Does that make sense? So because of that, um, they'll just get straight in and do something with it. Yeah? Like it'll be amazing and it'll be, technology will serve them as opposed to what worries me sometimes that with my generation we kind of you know, look up at technology as if we serve technology. So that makes me feel very happy and positive, yeah, because I've always believed that technology is a system, yeah, it's, it's a cause and effect linear, series of linear relationships. Cool. Does that answer the question? Yeah, thank you. Good, good, thank I'm glad. You. Thank yeah. you for asking interesting questions. Quite an impact, wasn't it? What effect did he have on you? Most magicians reveal the mystery of their trick. However, Vin Guillen reveals the mystery behind the mind. I'm speaking with him at Wide for Wonder. The simplicity of the trick creates confusion within the human mind. Yes. Which is more complex, the mystery of the trick or the mystery of the human mind? And if the mind is more complex than the trick, how can it be fooled? Okay, you made me really think hard when you asked me this, okay? So the, what you're saying is the mind is more complex, so how can the mind that is complex fall for something that the mind created? Because other human beings created magic, right? And magic is simple, so how can something simple fool a complex mind? It's actually quite simple how it works. It's human nature to overcomplicate things. All right, so say for example, um, something that a lot of people can relate to, say, say weight loss, okay? It's actually really simple weight loss if you think about it. You just eat less, exercise more. But then there are all these crazy complex programs and routines out there because as human beings, we like to think that achieving a goal requires complexity, right? So that way, if we don't achieve it, it's an excuse. So to us, we go, oh, I didn't achieve that goal because it's too complicated and that's why I can't do it. So because of the nature of human beings, and the fact that we really, we really like to complicate things, that allows magic to just kind of bypass your radar and completely fool the complex mind by being simple. So when you understand magic, magic is very, very simple. And that's the main reason. The hum as human beings, we, we, we just naturally overcomplicate things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the same with business or same with like success. We like to think success is really hard, so if we don't achieve it, then we think, oh, it's okay because it's really hard. That's why I didn't achieve it, because it's really hard. Mm -hmm. So we make things complex so we can use it as an excuse. Mm. And that's, that's kind of the, the thought I put into it. Yeah, so hopefully that makes sense. No, it did make sense. It made Good. sense. I guess, is science taking the mystery from magic? Or is science enabling magic to move from an art to a science? I think magic will always be an art and not in science, because magic is all about... Magic is the art of performance. It's an art. So I don't think it's it's going to ever move to a science because if it moves to a science then magic will no longer exist because science is theory and explanation magic is mystery no explanation so that, that's the first part of the question I think the second part you asked is does science help magic 
definitely. Ma science, a lot of people say that magic is just science people don't understand yet. That's all that magic is. So, absolutely. Magic, uh, science has changed how magic has evolved in the last 10 years dramatically. Some of the things I'll be doing on stage in about an hour is science. So, but people just don't know it's science. Mm. And so I guess when, I mean, okay, so in the past, science yes. was, uh, magic was considered, you know, evil. Paranormal. Paranormal, yeah. exactly. It didn't have a cause. Yeah. There, there was no cause to it. And now yes. we have a scientific cause towards it. So, you know, the brain is creating this illusion because yes. that's what it, you know. I yeah. guess can you create these parallels between, you know, past perceptions of magic to what it was and then how it's been incorporated with science now? Okay, I mean, I think, like you said, magic in the early 1900s, before in the late 1800s, was seen as something evil, like you said. You know, you'd get burnt, you'd get killed if you were doing it. But then slowly in the early 1900s, Harry Houdini, obviously, you know, um, he, sorry, I said, I, you should know, as if you should know, but you shouldn't have to know, but you should know. Um, he, he turned something that was seen as evil into entertainment. So he went, he fully took an entertainment kind of a path. And where I really want to take it is using magic, not only for entertainment, but as a vehicle to help engage people. So to me, magic is still a, is still a form of entertainment, but when used correctly, it can be used as like, a, like an artificial sweetener for things that are boring. Do you think there's still a need? So science reveals the mystery. Yes. But do you still think, and obviously I, I, after watching your document, uh, some of your videos, you actually break down magic tricks. Yes. I guess, do you believe there's still a need for mystery then? I mean, science seems to take that I think away. so, I think so. Because if there's no mystery, then curiosity also dies. And if curiosity dies, innovation will cease. If you think about it, what's innovation? Innovation is somebody who questions the norm, who questions how things are. You know, why do I have to ride a horse? Why? There must be better ways of travel. If, that, if, if people stop questioning, there will no longer be innovation. So to me, mystery, you think about all the amazing entrepreneurs like Steve Jobs and, and these people who are amazing people, they kept questioning things. They kept, they were curious, there must be a better future, there must be a better way to, to experience the internet, there must be a better way to experience music. And because of these constant questions and curiosity, innovation happens. So I think there's a huge need for mystery and it's needed now more than ever. Because we're living in an age, and I'm sorry I, I do digress, but we're living in an age, it's, I call it the illusion of knowledge. Because we believe we know everything, but we don't. Right? Because if you think about it, where do you ask questions? Internet. Who put the answers there? Humans. Who asked the question? Humans. How can we innovate? If, we ask, if we're answering our own questions, and if we stop asking more questions, then we can't innovate. So to me, it's, it's yeah, I, absolutely important. Mystery is required mm. to innovate. Have you combined your skills as an, uh, as an you, were, you began accounting yes, and you also then as a magician and an entrepreneur. Yeah. I guess you're ultimately a behavioral psychologist that teaches <laughs> lateral thinking in a sense. Well, look, I probably wouldn't say I'm a psychologist. I didn't do the degree. I, I learned a lot from psychologists because I used to go um, see them, not because, well, I wanted to see a psychologist because I wanted to understand how the mind works. And instead of doing the degree, I thought, well, it's much easier to go to a psychologist, pay them you know, $300 an hour, and just go, Let's teach me what I want to learn. So they kind of helped me fast track my learning in the area of psychology as opposed to doing a six, seven year degree. I just wanted to learn what I wanted to learn. So in spending time with them, I realized that I could combine my knowledge in the world of magic, which I've been doing for like 15, 16 years, combine that with the lessons I've learned in my life that have changed my life. So not necessarily with accounting, but things, key things in my life that have helped me to succeed. So, you know, I believe everybody has these amazing lessons in life, even you. And it's about how do we share those wonderful lessons that have completely changed our lives with other people. So I use magic as a vehicle for that. You know, because like, I think in the question you asked me if I ever used magic with accounting, I think that would get me in jail, Liam. I think uh, yeah, I'd make tax disappear and go to jail probably. So <laughs> not a good thing, not a good mix. But I think a great mix when you're trying to share a message and create inspiration and motivation in others. How do you see the intertwined future of science and youth? Look, I think 
You know, I, I think it's one of those things, again, that because we're living in an era where there's an abundance of knowledge, um, I think there's almost too much knowledge. That the executive Google once said that, um, I think he said this in 2009 or 2010, he said, all the information that's ever existed on Earth since 2010 to the beginning of time, so you think about it, all those cave drawings, all those magazines, all those papers that have been done during you know, 2010 all the way to the beginning of man, all that information and data, that's being uploaded onto the internet every single 48 hours. So we're living in a world where we have so much information, especially in the, in the area of science. I think there's so much abundance that it's causing the youth to disengage sometimes as well. Because there's just too much. There's too, because content used to be king. Now I don't think content is king. I think context is king now, not content. So I think it's all about making, it's all about making the medicine taste good again. It's about, you know, the youth is becoming harder and harder to engage. Their attention span is dropping every single day. So to give them a book, 400 pages or to make them read a 20 page article online about science, they won't do it. So now I think for science to influence the youth in a good way, we're going to have to find a way to make the medicine taste good. Yeah. That was magic. Thought control and the blurring of the lines between virtual reality and reality. It sounds like something out of the movies. Well, Dr. Jordan can tell us more. So, my name is Jordan Yun. I'm a biomedical engineer. And biomedical is very much sort of innovating and inventing new medical devices. And they can be for, you know, a whole range of areas of health. And, uh, and for me, my focus is uh, disability. So, we designed a, uh, a brain-computer interface. And this was with the health, uh, Centre for Health Technologies in uh, University of Technology in Sydney. Mm -hmm. And we designed a, a brain-computer interface, so it was basically a, uh, a headband with some electrodes in it, completely non-invasive, and it picked up on the um, electrical activity of the brain and allowed a person to focus on different thoughts to control the wheelchair and to allow the wheelchair to move so that the wheelchair knew where it was supposed to go. I guess, well then, in that case, what type of disabilities can that be used for? Disabilities, are, there's a lot of crossovers. You know, when we're looking at cerebral palsy, motor neuron disease, spina bifida, spine injury, spinal cord injury, um, there are so many different things that would require it. It depends on the type of level and the type of options that are available for things like mobility. And these have crossovers again into communication, into entertainment, education, all of the different things that you use throughout the day to access, you know, information to do all the things in your day-to-day -day life. We need to design different devices for those people who uh, don't have the same modes of movement. Mm. And so the inspiration to design this wheelchair was to try and break through those barriers and to, to release new products to the market that reached higher levels of disability to allow independence in many aspects of their life. I guess, can you also talk about them personal experience? I mean, how, you yes. were paralysed for 24 hours, is that correct? What was that? I know, it's, I know it's hard to create a parallel considering you're not, it's a lot long. Yes. But so then how did, I guess, how did you actually feel? Like you're sitting in a bed and you cannot move. What was that like? I mean, I know it inspired you yeah. to create this, but yeah. what was that like? It's a truly life-changing thing. I'll set the record straight. I think, um, I, don't, I can't remember where that came from. I wasn't paralysed. I got to experience what it's like sort of like to be paralysed. And I guess um, it's something that you don't forget. You'll never forget it. It's just when you have a moment like that in your life that just suddenly changes your perspective on everything in an absolute moment. I thought I had everything taken away from me. The, the crunch and the, that sound and the feeling I felt in my neck, um, that moment has gone over in my head many times since and that was about eight years ago now. And, uh, and that, that is quite honestly terrifying. You just think, you suddenly start to think about all the things that you take for granted, all the things in your life that you know that you've got and that you can do, and then you start to think differently. You think, what, you know, has this been taken away? Um, am I ever going to do things for me? I was saying, am I ever going to play tennis again? You know, whenever I used to injure myself, I'd think, can I play tennis? If I can, great, I don't, I don't really care. Um, it was the biggest part of my life, and so that really made me think differently about life and completely changed my perspective on life too. Mm. Mm. Um, I, so, do you see a future where disability doesn't exist, but it's rather just diverse forms of living? I think we're going to get there. I think advances in science and technology, they go different ways and they work in parallel. So obviously, you know, technology advances help um, science advances as well. And so the way I see it is things like the wheelchair, 
things like making things smarter and being able to create new devices, they're all a gateway. It's a bridge to bridge the gap between now and when science really takes over and, and, uh, and allows um, change and allows you know, repairing of, say, the spinal cord or, or cures to the, um, to the individual disability. Um, and I think we'll, we will get there. You know, I think for many disabilities they are curable, but they're complex. They're very complex. Maybe not in a sense of curable though, but maybe mm. in a sense of just acknowledging that they're actual disabilities, but we can live with them and integrate oh, yes. them in a sense. Absolutely. So not in a sense of curing them, but yep. um, you know, just having them as a part of a life. Yeah, well, absolutely, and I think that's, you know, we are already there. It's just society needs to have that change, and a lot of that comes with awareness. When you meet someone who can change your life and change the way that you think about life within a, a few moments, um, you know, it's a beautiful thing. I think that it's opened up my horizons and I've just gotten to know some of the most amazing people I know happen to have disabilities. It's that idea of you're creating these new ways and these new forms of how people yep. can just live a life. Yeah. And it's incredible, really. Well, that's, that's it. I think it's really we've got, it's a, it's a change in perspective. So the way I see it is, you know, the brain is so incredibly complex. I mean, it's this thing that we're still learning to understand and you know, I think it's going to take quite a lot longer before we actually fully understand the brain. We have our conscious mind, and that's in the same area of real estate as the rest of the brain, which is controlling everything that happens in this body. It knows how to send the signals, it knows how to receive all the, the sensory signals back, and it knows how to interpret all of that, do so much all at once, it processes huge amounts of data. And at the same time, then there's our conscious mind, which is within the same real estate, yet somehow there's some things that don't go between, and there's some communication that doesn't happen there. We don't know how our body operates, but we're still somewhere within this brain. And that's a strange thing. The brain knows how to operate the body, yet our conscious mind doesn't. We have to learn about how our body works. It's really that the, the brain is, is this central processing unit. It's our CPU. You know, it's just like you know, what runs your computer. It's, this is the thing that processes everything with our bodies. And our bodies are kind of like big meat vehicle you know and this is the thing that you've this is the the shift in thinking that I've had when I've seen how sometimes the brain can be disconnected in some way from the body um, or have signals flipped and, and, and interpreted in different ways or the connections um, won't get through the connection is either broken or it's um, somewhat changed when the mind is working absolutely fine and it's just more like a disconnect to the body that's where I thought I understand this and I understand how to make um, some changes here and that's where I wanted to really learn a lot more about how those signals get to the rest of the body and how we can intercept them yeah. and take those signals amplify them and use them to control um, equipment because again going off brain plasticity the idea is that the brain can just rewire itself very quickly and you can build up uh, coordination very quickly to use devices as an extension of yourself. And that's a really interesting thing and that's what I want to get towards. Yeah. Yes, and how does this, this wheelchair, you know, can a wheelchair run in fear? Can it move in fear? Like, you know, can it pace itself in anger? How does that, how, do, how does right. the machine, you yep. know, recognise emotion? Okay, so recognising emotion is I guess different to displaying emotion. Two very different things and I guess when we're looking at um, a robotic system we're nowhere near self-awareness, true self-awareness in robotics and artificial intelligence yet AI has gotten to the point where it's still it's still up there with being pretty you know, I guess exciting and creepy at the same time and we have that ability to be aware of ourselves and aware of our environment and really analyze um, all of those and I think that's a, a very interesting thing so being able to analyze the signals from the human brain about you know what's going on what's happening in the brain what are we thinking about um, that sort of thing can be done and those are done through brain computer interfaces where we can do things like visualize something visualize a, a 3d object and imagine it rotating and then we've got a piece of software that can pick up on that look at the patterns and understand that you were thinking of something that it has seen before a lot of it comes with training you train the software to to learn to see the patterns. So this can then be used to control something like a wheelchair, like a smart wheelchair, but having the smart wheelchair itself be self-aware or feel things like fear or happiness or sadness, we haven't gotten there yet and 
arguably I don't think we really should get there. Um, <laughs> I don't really, I don't really see so much the point personally. Personally speaking, I don't see the the point in trying to get there. Um, but people like to because you know we do like to marvel at our own creations. I've seen um, yeah I've seen humanoids that can simulate emotion. He'll say you know I love you, and then stop and analyze it. He'll go well. I love you as much as a robot can love in that I know these are programmed emotions and this is a response and this is a simulation, but as far as I know what the meaning of love is, I love you. That kind of is a very, that brings up a very interesting topic, I guess. So yeah. can, there, can there ever be a line drawn between, you know, what is man and then what is mm. machine? True. I think that, I think that we definitely do need to draw lines but it's very hard, whenever we venture into new territory, it's very hard to draw lines as to what should we be doing and what should we not be doing. Because as innovation turns up and starts disrupting the industries, these things change so quickly, it's very hard to keep up with. And, um, and it doesn't matter what it is, when it comes to these sort of innovations, you're going to get a polarisation of people. And what, what would be your concern in a sense of having a humanoid robot? I know humanoids is probably a blanket mm. term, but... Yeah. No, it's, it's very true. I think that when it comes to robotics, you've got to look at the bigger picture. You know, you've, you've got to look at the bigger picture. Why are you designing robotics and how is it going to be integrated into the lives um, of the people around it? And then, you know, for any particular design, what's its purpose, what's its function? And then when you're designing software, and as software and algorithms get more and more intelligent, which they do, artificial intelligence does uh, get more and more complex, you've got to think, where's our limits, where are our boundaries, what is this thing's purpose? Because is there a point in putting too much intelligence into something? Also, if you're trying to get towards, if we're looking at humanoids, we're trying to get towards something close to resembling self-awareness where it can make its own decisions and it can formulate its own um, ideas, basically taking in information from its environment and then deciding what it's going to learn and what it's not going to learn, um, what sort of areas it's going to venture into. How much do you let it understand itself the way that we do? You know, again, we don't understand our entire body, we have to learn it. How much do you let it know about itself and be able to manipulate itself? How much do you let it manipulate its environment? and how much do you let it interact and understand all the people around it. So if they then became self-aware and then they decided that they didn't want to be ruled by humans, that's where the matrix idea is. And when it comes to virtual reality, it's exactly where we're getting. We're getting towards this term called virtual presence. So something like the Oculus Rift or some form of, uh, of virtual reality device, you put a headset on and that tricks your visual sense straight away because when you turn, it turns with you. And so you're looking at whatever you know, you feel like you're there. You can turn all the way around and you see what's behind you. Once you start getting through all of those things and tricking more and more senses, that's when you get towards the term called virtual presence, where you are in and you feel like you are completely in a virtual world. And I can tell you already, it's gone to the point where you can let go quite easily and you can just feel like you're in this virtual world. So horror movies don't scare me at all because you've got that disconnect. You know, you know, if really, there's something you don't want to see, look away from the TV. You also know that when you're not watching the horror movie, that you can be walking through the hallways in your own house, you can turn around and you know you're not going to see anything. Now, when you try a horror game, and the first time it hits you, that you can't see anything, but you can hear it, and you realise if you turn around, you're going to see it. I can't describe the feeling it gives you just the first time. It is terrifying. And then it throws you off when you're back in the real world, it can, depending on how immersed you find yourself. You can be back in the real world and then you know, you, you sort of get that uneasy feeling that you've turned around in a, in a game and you've seen something scary. Now the thing is, I think this is where the, the real interesting part of virtual reality is. It's not just when you're there experiencing it. It's when you think back to the game that you just played or the experience that you just played and you feel like you just actually experienced it because so many of your senses were tricked at once and you tend to remember things in context 
so you remember that context and it doesn't feel like you just played a game, it feels like you were just there. The philosophical question of whether we are as human beings within this reality, is yes. this reality real? Yes. And then you know, we question if the reality that I'm sitting here, I am existing. Yes. You know, I think therefore I am. Yes. And then you have yep. you know, this virtual reality. You know, but in a sense that's now becoming blurred completely because yes. it's like you're feeling it, you're in it, and then yep. this is the world which I'm in and I feel. Yep. I guess, how can you discuss this blurring of the lines between these yep. two fundamental realities, I guess? Really, when it comes to the blurring of the lines between what's real and what isn't, it's a very interesting thing. It's a, a very interesting thing you raise. It's our idea that if we see and touch and feel and hear and use all our senses, and we're engaging all those senses, then it must be real. And that's why you can trick those senses, because if you think about it, everything, everything we sense are electrical impulses sent to the brain, and it's the way that the brain interprets it. And so we might potentially perceive things quite differently, but not realise it, because we explain what we see. You might see something that you call red, and I see it as well, and I say it's red, but the way you see it might be a completely different thing. You might be seeing what, if I was looking through your eyes, I'd be like, wait, that's, that's blue. How do we know? What if those, that colour spectrum that we know is shifted between different people and you've got somewhere else that's, you know, everyone's got a different calibration. We can't possibly know that because it's, you know, when we describe it, we describe it based on what we see. What I wanted to look at was what are the ways that we can change that for the better? What things can we use virtual reality for in a good way? And I think that it can have very positive impacts. I've seen research of someone using um, an amputee who, has, who doesn't have an arm using a, uh, a virtual reality device that shows them that they've got a hand and then it helps get rid of phantom pain. And that's the interesting thing. I see where the research can go and I can, can just see so many, so many possibilities on where the research can go. So um, that's why when it comes to virtual reality, I'm working with a, a little startup that are, um, I probably wouldn't have gone on board with if they didn't have a research psychologist. That was really interesting. I thought there's a lot we can gain out of this and see the positive impacts that it could potentially have because it's going to have both. And again, when these technologies come along, a lot of the time they have both. So it depends what you want to focus on. In scientific research, I guess, is there a battle between compensate and eliminate? That's a very good question. So I guess, uh, oh, so to compensate or to eliminate, I think it's a really interesting topic. I think it's a, a really interesting approach that different people take, again, differently. So for me, I think in terms of disability and the areas that I look into, I look at compensation until elimination comes along. So when we're looking at, and when I say elimination, elimination of, um, say, a particular condition, I say we compensate because compensation can be a lot faster. When we're saying compensate, I'm saying design, say a wheelchair for mobility, until something like a cure comes along to spinal cord injury um, and you have a wheelchair as your main method of mobility, make the wheelchair more, um, more intelligent and allow it to be accessed by more people with someone, um, by people who have, say, spinal cord injury. So target the people who don't currently have access to the devices, allow them to use it as well, and that's compensation up until the point where we can eliminate that problem by fixing the spinal cord in some way. Now, if again, this is the idea between compensation and elimination. We don't know how to eliminate that problem, but if that happens, if that occurs, that'll likely put the first one out. So that's where the competition comes from. But I think, in general, for the overall human race, compensation and elimination generally work together. I guess, how do you see the future of youth and science? How are they intertwined now, do you believe? I think that it comes from the perspective of technology. I think the youth of today are absolute technological integrators. They understand technology in a completely different way to their previous generations, and this is the sort of thing that we need to help nurture as an older generation. Any generations before them need to start helping nurture this and, and to understand it because we marvel at technology, whereas as a whole, the younger generations don't. They just see the limitations of it and they see what they can do with them. And to have that from such a young age, as long as we give them the right guidance, they could go into the things and use the technology in a way that will make impact. They can learn to innovate, and if they learn to innovate and also see the areas that they could go into and be inspired by the things that will make change and make the, the world a better place, then you know, they will lead themselves there. And that's really 
I guess, um, a big area that I want to have involvement in because there are many issues plaguing our planet and we need to be able to all work together in some way and be able to guide the next generation coming through to make the changes that we can't ourselves. And, uh, and this is a, a big part of, of uh, why I'm here. Wow. What more can I say? Have you ever wondered where all the information goes? Well, Andrew Fersman knows. He's a specialist in quantum computers, and I'm speaking with him at Wired for Wonder. You engineer quantum computers to use complex equations, algorithms, in order to use information and data to answer complex questions. What do you believe is the most important question to ask? So, uh, I think that the most interesting questions are actually deceptively simple, especially for the types of computers that we're building. For us, what we're always looking for are simple questions with many different possible outcomes and then looking at the answers that are the very best. So a concrete example might be you want to deliver these same 40, let's just keep with that number. We want to deliver 40 packages from our UPS truck and then get back home. The problem expands in that same way where adding 41 packages on, you've now got double the number of possible routes that are in there. So we always look at uh, really the, the field is called combinatorial optimization. Uh, really what you're looking to do is to find the best possible answer among a population of potential good answers. Have we outsourced Pandora's box? So, um, no, we keep our own Pandora's box in-house. We think it's very important to make sure that uh, we, we don't let anyone else have it. Right. You know, to me, um, well, problem solving is a, a key human skill. I think the most important human skill is problem identification. And so I think if we can outsource problem solving to machines and be able to look ourselves at what problems deserve to be answered and to think a little bit more about where should we add this, then uh, I see that as being far more valuable. I would much rather have humans do the things that humans are best at and leave machines to be crunching away, getting the answers and providing that back so that we can spend more time wondering about the world and less time sharpening pencils. So they act as a medium in a sense. Yeah, I think that's right. That's cool. So he who controls data controls the world. Is data the new oil? I'm going to be contrarian and to say that no, and that's a ridiculous comparison. And the reason I think that specifically is because if by the new oil you mean oil is an important resource, then yes, data is an important resource. But just off the top of my head, um, I can pick apart so many things that I think make it a terrible analogy. For example, the world is a finite supply of oil and we're using it up. Whereas the world has an infinite capability to produce data and it's accelerating. It's almost like the anti-oil in that regard. What I think is fair is that um, data in many ways is the new currency and in that way I think the idea of data being the value driver um, is very interesting you know, he or she who makes the best decisions might rule the world, and data is a big part of that. But I think it oversimplifies the situation to say that, you know, if you're the person who's sitting on top of a giant stream of data that, um, you know, ipso facto you win. There's a lot that needs to happen to, uh, well, to take advantage of the oil metaphor again, to refine that data in order to make it actionable. So you definitely won't see Mark Zuckerberg controlling the world anytime soon. I wouldn't say that. I would just say that if he manages to do that, it's going to be a combination of many different things and that having that data is very important, but um, there is a big difference between um, power of information and sort of raw power. Mm. Um, I guess, can we expand on this idea and talk about the morals and ethics behind the people that actually, the morals and ethics behind um, the ownership and the control of data? Sure. Um, you know, my thought is that the explicit contract really is um, I get my email for free and this is a service that I find very valuable. 
Um, but we all know nothing's free. And in exchange, what I give away is the right for um, the company that provides my email services, which is Google, um, to utilize the contents of my emails in order to provide me, ideally, um, meaningful advertisements, things that you know, present me with information and allows me to make choices that I would like. Um, I think as long as we're making responsible and informed decisions, then someone can say, look, here's, here's the deal. And I say, you know what, I'm not comfortable with that. I'm going to opt out. Um, I personally don't have a Facebook account, and maybe it's because I'm an out-of-touch old man, but maybe it's because I just don't feel that the benefits that it provides are consummate with the lack of control that I have over the data that I would be generating. Uh, on the other hand, I'm a, a big fan of LinkedIn and I utilize that and I understand that there's a very similar bargain that you make, but in that instance I'm comfortable with it. So I think as long as people do a good job of presenting the bargain so that people can make an informed decision about whether or not they would like to trade their data for the service that's being provided, then that's ethical. And the lack of ethics only seems to come into me when there's that lack of transparency. Mm, that's very true. It's quite interesting then because it would come down to a sense of knowledge, but then for those who don't actually have the ability to get that knowledge or are limited to understanding that, it seems a bit of a niche in a sense. There is really a, um, a big question of what is the right amount of interference with people's data that either government or any group should be able to um, you know, really impose on them and how will that change their behavior? And I think that when you really look at what's happening today, um, people are able to make reasonably informed decisions. Um, I think that there are probably some questions that people might have about you know, what things their data can really be used for and, and being concerned about this, these sorts of things from these services. But I actually, I feel like the bigger concern for me is not so much about um, having people not understand the agreements that they're getting into. It's much more about people getting into situations where they're not agreeing to things at all. I think that's probably the most vulnerable, that, or the place where we're most vulnerable right now. Just on my last question, um, so within political philosophy, I guess you have uh, Marxism, which talks about you know a need, you know you're fulfilling the need of a community, and then you have classical liberalism that basically is complete liberty, and it you know it, it gives to those in need in the community. Is our today society? It seems in the sense that this economy, this, this sort of basis is just driven by desire and wants. Can you discuss the extent to which you know, desire is, is driving the market or is it driving the market? Um, well, I've got to say I think that um, in many ways that's sort of the entire goal of the advertising industry is to instill a desire and a drive to make you want things that you don't need. If you need something, I don't need to convince you to buy it, right? There's nobody out here saying like, drink water, like it's great. Um, there are people saying, drink water that doesn't come from your tap, that comes in this bottle that's expensive and an alternative. Uh, you need to be convinced that this is a better thing to do for yourself because you know it's, it's certainly not a straight up necessity. Um, so in, in many ways, I think that capitalism is about trying to uh, instill new desires. And I think that you know, your, your question really sort of the answer is just yes. Uh, it's something I think we see over and over again that the things that the whole capitalist marketplace, it allows people to um, vote for the things that they would like with their dollars and if people aren't voting for your product then you don't survive uh, but there's sort of two ways to go about curing that you can either build something that people want or you can make people want the thing that you build and I think any 
intelligent company would probably be pursuing both avenues right now. Um, the companies I think that we prefer from a societal benefit standpoint probably more try and fill existing needs as opposed to creating new perceived needs. Uh, and really I suppose the, the best marketers are those who are able to turn desires into perceived needs. Um, that's definitely a big part of the system that we live in today and whether it serves our best interests or not, um, it kind of comes hand in hand with a free speech, free market society. So I guess how do you see the future of youth and science? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, <clears throat> I suppose um, the future that I see for youth is that they'll grow up and grow old. Um, and, you know, really science is something that happens, um, you know, we think of it as being like what people who are traditionally old men in lab coats maybe, you know, swirling around things in beakers or thinking about things. But it's changed. It's now, you know, our organization is um, young men and young women from around the world. We've got people from all sorts of different countries working together to try and understand the best way to apply this radical new technology of quantum computers. Thank you very much. Well, Big Brother doesn't seem that scary anymore, but as long as Andrew has something to do with it, we're safe. Science as a discipline, in my opinion, shares many parallels to the arts, such as journalism, photography and film. The main force driving both is our curiosity and our beautiful disposition to ask why. We are all truly wired for wonder. I hope you enjoyed. <laughs>